Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to New Zor Education. Um, the subject of today's lecture is um, statistical regression. And uh, this lecture is actually part of the um, advanced mathematics course which uh, is presented on unizor.com website. It's uh, for um, teenagers and uh, high school students interested in mathematics as the tool to develop their creativity, logic, analytical thinking, etc. And uh, so I do recommend you to watch this lecture from unizor.com website because it contains, the site contains uh, detailed description notes for every lecture. So you can basically go throughout the whole course as well as a textbook and some kind of a video explanation of what this is all about. All right, um, so statistical regression. Now, before going into mathematics of this subject, let's just talk about what is basically statistical regression. Well, it's, uh, it's all about dependency between different things. Um, let me just give you a few examples of how one thing depends on some other thing. Now, if we, if we will be able to establish this dependency um, and we can state that this dependency is relatively tight, then knowing one, we can actually predict or explain another. So that's basically the reason why we are interested in uh, statistical regression. Um, now, so let me start from something which is um, very, very simple and it represents a very, very strict like formula related to dependency between um, random variables, between two random variables. Now, consider we are measuring a temperature with two thermometers at the same time and at the same place. But these two thermometers are one is measuring in the units of Celsius and another in units of Fahrenheit. So, we have two different random variables because at different times, at different places, we have different values, right? So, um, however, if we, if we take these two thermometers together and we measure the temperature by both of them, then we know that there is a formula that the degrees of Celsius are related to degrees of Fahrenheit with this formula. Now, this is a very straightforward direct dependency of one on another. So knowing this one, we can definitely say that we don't really have to measure it with another thermometer, we can just calculate it. So, this is a dependency which is uh, very, very strict or strong or whatever you want to use this word. Now, there are some cases when this dependency exists, but it's not really very deterministic. Here is my example. Let's consider um, two different random values. One is a volcanic activity during the year. Well, I don't know how to measure it, but let's consider that we can measure it in some units. Maybe the amount of dirt which volcanoes are actually um, uh, putting out uh, on the surface, or, or whatever measurement. And uh, let's say the average temperature during the year um, for an entire planet, let's say. So we have certain number of points, and uh, every day at a at, at, at certain time we measure the temperature and then we are averaging throughout the whole year. So we have a whole year of volcanic activity which is basically measured by one number and the whole year of um, temperatures which we are averaging. Now, year after year after year we make measurements of these two uh, random variables and we have certain statistics. Are they related? I mean, we would like to establish certain procedure which would help us to uh, analyze this relationship because 
if we are able to do it, we can actually do certain predictions maybe for the temperature based on some volcanic activity which we observe. So in this particular case, there is some relationship, but we don't really know what it is. It's definitely not like this one. There is no formula which relates to these things. But we do um, would like we would like to know what what kind of relationship can be established, if any, and um, if it is, then how exactly it would be expressed in some way or another. Now, a few more examples. Okay, this example is the example of. Um, cause and effect. So in this case, let me um, um, suggest you the following. Uh, parents are paying for an education of their child. Now, is there any relationship between the amount of money they spend and amount of knowledge uh, their child will absorb? Um, well, maybe i mean it's reasonable to assume that more expensive school would probably provide better education but then there are some other factors which are not really related to this particular uh, to, to to money let's say for instance how well this particular student can absorb the information which is given to him um how much time he spends for for all this and there are many other circumstances which are involved so again there is some kind of a relationship and in this case, this is like a cause and effect uh, relationship. Question is, is it reasonable to assume for the parents that, okay, next year, if we will spend more on education, we will get better results? Because if they can, if they can afford it, then yes, it does make sense, right? All right, so basically now we are interested in this relationship for the purpose of making certain decisions which are very very important um, another relationship is rela I mean another example for this type of relationship is weather forecast does the weather tomorrow depend on the weather today let's say we are measuring temperature tomorrow and today and then we're repeating this day after day now if we have the temperature today, can I predict the temperature tomorrow with certain level of um, precision? Well, again, we can analyze how this relationship between temperature today and tomorrow were historically, and then if we can establish such, uh, such relationship, maybe it also depends on some additional parameters like whether it's morning or afternoon or some other thing. But in any case, if we will be able to establish this type of relationship, it will help us to forecast the, 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 the temperature for, for, the, for the next day or something, right? So it does make very practical sense to, to know, to express in some way this relationship. Now, whatever, what else I have? Okay, my last example is about medical treatment. Now, we have obviously certain illnesses which are treated in many different ways. Um, you can treat it with drugs, and there are many different drugs, probably for the same for the same illness. We have, um, uh, for instance, different food, different uh, uh, style of life, more active, less active, exercise, etc. They're all involved in the process of treatment of certain illnesses. Now, which one is more important? Which one is less important? So we have to really measure. Like, for instance, we have three different drugs. So we are probably collecting certain statistics, we are administering these drugs to different people, and then we see if there is a relationship between, um, let's say, the time the patient gets better for, for uh, uh, using one drug versus another drug. So this type of relationship is very, very important for, again, very practical reasons for treatment of the people. So, I think I have convinced you that relationship between um, uh, random variables is very important and it would be nice if we can measure it in some way and that's what this lecture will be about now obviously whenever we introduce mathematics into real life 
uh, it needs to be real life needs to be simplified as much as possible otherwise the mathematics will be horrendous and in this case I'm going to actually um, offer a model which would be a very simple model of uh, well some practical situation and uh, based on this model I will talk about uh, statistical regression and in particular about linear regression so what exactly the model I'm talking about let's consider that you have two random variables random variable X which we will call independent uh, random variable and random variable Y which will be dependent one it can be like temperature today and temperature an hour from today or it can be a particular drug which we are administering and this would be the um, how how well the, the this drug actually works on the patient or whatever different reasons what we would like to establish is some kind of a linear dependency that would be great I mean if we will establish linear dependency between these things like this that would be terrific so if we will have for, for instance some statistical information x1 x2 etc xn and y1 y2 y2 etc yn and all of them are lying on this particular line because this is just a line that's why the whole dependency is called linear linear regression well that would be terrific but obviously that's not practical case and in practical life there is always some kind of a deviation no matter how we try this is X this is Y so no matter how we try to put our line and these are correspondingly X1 X2 X3 X4 etc and these are corresponding y1, y2, y3, y4, etc. So no matter how we draw the line, we cannot put all the points on that line. There is something always higher or, or, or lower that line, which means it's not really such a relationship. However, if you will put it on a graph, it might look like maybe there is some line which is relatively close to all of them so our purpose is to find such a line which would be the closest to all of these points at the same time as possible how can it be done well usually the way how it is done is the following let's say this is the line and you have always certain deviation from this line up or down right so if you will take all these deviations and since they are either positive or negative let's square them and edit them together that would be actually uh, the measurement of how close the line is to all these points uh, combined so it's a least square method so to speak so if we will be able to find the line which would minimize the squares some of the squares of all these distances then we will probably be satisfied now then we can actually check this some of these uh, squares of the distances and if it's relatively small and again need some explanation what it means relatively small then we will accept this line as some kind of a um, good relationship which can be explained in approximately can be explained in this formula and uh, it can be used actually for um, some future um, results if these are for instance results of some uh, drug treatment then we can say okay yes it looks like it works and we can establish uh, uh, this uh, drug as uh, as the good one and uh, and then we can put additionally um, additional people for uh, treatment with this uh, drug and we would expect this result to be somewhere within this line all right so let's again go back to mathematics this is all nice philosophy mathematically it looks like this I assume 
that there are some A and B which um, are basically combined into this formula they are not exactly um, the results of the of the uh, random variable um, Y but if we will add some random variable epsilon which basically characterizes how far my line is from actual values of y so this is also some kind of a uh, random variable and what I assume is that this random variable characterizes our arrow and it's a normal variable with um, mean zero and some kind of a uh, variance sigma square so our purpose is now if you think about what is variance well variance considering this is not really we don't really know the random variables we know statistics so instead of x we have x1 x2 xn which we observe or we set instead of y we have y2 1 2 etc 1 n which we observe and then epsilon would be a difference between them and um, if we are talking about um, the difference in square and then summarized throughout the whole number of experiments that actually would be the sample variance right for epsilon so our purpose is to, to find a and b to minimize this sample variance which is the difference between y and ax plus b square summarized throughout whole experiments all right okay so we have this particular problem formulated we have two random variables which we assume to be um, of certain uh, distribution and we assume that the difference between ax plus b and y is some kind of a normally distributed random variables with average with mean value zero and some um, variance and we would like to find a and b in such a way that would minimize the variance and now let's go to statistics we don't know the distribution of y and x we know the statistics so we have y1 y2 etc yn and we have x1 x2 etc xn okay so how can we find now we have two variables which we have to find out so first of all let me make the following um, simplification now considering these are two random variables and epsilon is normally distributed let me have a um, mathematical expectation of left and the right side so forget about statistics for a while now we are in theory of probabilities assuming we do know the distribution of y and x right then the um, uh, mathematical expectation of y should be equal to a times mathematical expectation of x plus b plus mathematical expectation of epsilon which is actually equal to zero right because we assumed right so that's very good actually we have gotten rid of um, epsilon which we don't know anything about but now what happens is we really don't know mathematical expectation of x and y but we do know their statistics so instead of this I can assume that at least approximately this particular this particular equation equation takes place so instead of mathematical expectation of x which I don't know I'm taking the average which is a good approximation for mathematical expectation same thing here and these we do know because we do have uh, statistics historical data or whatever else already accumulated and that's how let's call this thing V 
and this thing u. So we know these two numbers, right? So I can now say that v is equal to a u plus b. So b is equal to v minus a u, which means my original equation can be reduced to only one variable. Since b is expressed in terms of a with two known numbers, these are just constants. This is average of x's and this is average of y's, right? So I can say that I'm actually looking for equation of this type. v minus a u plus epsilon or and, um, uh, I'm adding minus v to both sides. I will have y minus v equals to a x minus u plus epsilon. Now, why is this simpler? Well, first of all, because I have only one uh, variable to find instead of two, right? Now, y minus v and x minus u, I can assume that these are new uh, random variables with uh, mathematical expectation of zero. So I have two constants. These are empirically um, obtained averages of my observations. I have x's and y's, u and v. So these are constants. So I know them from historical observation, right? So I'm looking basically for y and x in, in such a way that now I have only one parameter to, to determine. And obviously I have statistics for this and I have statistics for this, right? So this is y minus y1 plus etc. plus yn divided by n, y2 minus y1 plus etc. yn divided by n, etc. yn minus average so I assume that I have these statistics. So instead of my original y1, y2, and yn, I will take new statistics, which are, uh, which are these ones. And the advantage is that the average is equal to 0. Now, same thing here. Instead of x1, x2, etc., I will have x1 minus x1 plus etc. plus xn divided by n x2 minus x1 plus etc. xn divided by n etc. xn minus x1 plus xn divided by n. So this is my new statistics which I have to use to find only one parameter a. Now how can I find it out? By minimizing the variance of epsilon. So I have to basically minimize um, okay what I will do is I will use different uh, letters, well the same letters with a bar on the top So what's what's the difference between x uh, two let's say and x two with a bar? Because x two with a bar is x two minus average of all x's. So I will use now a completely new equation, which looks exactly like this one but without the b. And I will assume that my random variable y and x have 0 as this mathematical expectation. So if I will be able to do this using my statistical observations x1 etc xn with the bar on the top and y1 yn with the bar on the top. So I have these statistics and I assume that there is some kind of a relationship. I have to find A 
to minimize variance of epsilon. Okay, now this is actually easy. I have already done everything because um, what should be uh, minimized? We should minimize y1 minus ax1 square plus etc plus yn minus axn square. That's what we have to minimize because this is basically a sample variance. Um, it's not sample variance. I mean, I have to divide it by n minus one. Doesn't really matter. It's all constant. So I have to minimize this to find my a, where uh, x1 and x2 and uh, y1 and y2, etc., with the bars are known um, numbers. They are obtained from original numbers x1, x2, etc., y1, y, y2, etc., by subtracting their average. So I know all these numbers, they're all known numbers. A is unknown, and I have to find A to minimize it. Well, this is actually simple, because what do I have now? I have a quadratic polynomial of A, right? So let's just rearrange it so it looks like real quadratic polynomial. So first, let's put A squared. So what would be in A squared? It's x1 squared, x2 squared, xn squared. So it will be that's what it is. Sum of x i square. Now, what will be with a? It's two a minus two a x one x uh, y one minus two a x two y two etc. So it will be minus two a sigma x i y i from one to n. And finally, my free member of this polynomial is y1 square up to uh, square. I have to put these bars on the top. Okay? And I know these numbers. Again, what is H, uh, uh, each uh, uh, x i with a bar? It's corresponding x y minus uh, average of all x y's, etc. So I know all these numbers, and how can I determine my A, which would minimize this thing? By the way, it's minimized because, you see, it's a polynomial with a positive uh, coefficient. So it's a parabola, and this is, if you have uh, uh, A squared P plus A Q plus R polynomial. Um, now, where is this point? It's minus Q divided by 2, two P, right? I hope you remember it from the polynomial, the quadratic polynomial. So, in this particular case, A, which minimizes our polynomial, is equal to minus Q, which is Two sigma x i y i divided by two double this two sigma x i square. Now obviously two can be reduced, and that's the answer. So we have found the a which minimizes variance of epsilon. Well, in, in, in graphical way, we have found the slope of the line which would um, approximate in the best possible way uh, all the points where xi and yi are positioned on the plane. Now, from this, we can obviously find the value of b. So if I will go back to my original, if you remember when there was a b here, um, my mathematical expectation of y would be equal to a mathematical expectation of x plus b, right? So b is equal to mathematical expectation of y minus a 
expectation of x. Now a, we know, it's this one. Now again, instead of expectation of y and expectation of x, we can take their average, and that's how we find b. Great, now we found a and b. What's next? Well, next is actually we have to find out how good our approximation with the line actually is. And the quality is, it's this value where a is exactly what we have found, right? So by substituting um, a into this formula, or into this polynomial, it doesn't really matter where it is, we can find exactly the value of this one. The value of variance of epsilon, which basically characterizes the quality of this approximation. I mean, it would be ideal if epsilon is equal to zero. Obviously, it never happens. Well, except if you're measuring Fahrenheit and Celsius. But the closer to zero is, it's better. But now, it's probably not a good idea to measure it in absolute terms. What do you mean closer to zero? Is one close to zero or not? Well, relative to what? Relative to a million, yes it is. Relative to two, it's not. So we probably have to compare the, now, no, knowing, uh, knowing this or this um, as, as a sigma square, well, if you divide it by n minus one, obviously, you have to divide it and get real um, variance. So knowing the variance, um, we can take the double square root of the variance, double standard deviation, as 95% uh, certainty that the epsilon would be in that particular area. So we know the interval epsilon is from 2 with 95% probability. And now we should really measure this interval relatively to average value of y, which we again know from empirical data. Now, if this two sigma interval of epsilon is relatively small to y, and in this, can, in this case I can say what relatively small is. For instance, we used to think that the 5% is not such a big deal, right? In our, you know, in many practical uh, problems. So if this double sigma is, um, well, actually it's probably four sigma because it's two sigma to the left and two sigma to the right. So if the four sigma is relatively small, like less than 5%, less than 0 0.05 from the average of y, then we can consider that, okay, I think we are within a very good um, margin of error uh, considering the y is actually somewhere around this linear function of x. And that means it's a good thing. If, however, this particular variance, or rather s uh, standard deviation, is too big for y, let's say it's half of the y, then our estimate is really very, very wrong. And obviously, in all the practical situations, people really do this type of calculations. So they can say that, okay, with, you know, a precision of no more than, than 3% or 5% or whatever, the values of y are, are lying very near the line which defines this linear dependency. So by setting, for instance, certain values of x as parameters, we can expect within this precision certain values of y. For instance, certain dosage you know, of some medication allows to expect the, the treatment to be, you know, I don't know, whatever, some number of uh, the lengths, let's say, of treatment or something like this. Or if we will invest certain amount of money in our child education, you will get approximately so much knowledge with certain error. All right, now, not everything in the world is linear, of course. We have made a tremendous simplification. Sometimes there are square functions. What if it's ax squared plus, plus bx plus c? Who knows? And these are all complications. 
again, I wanted to present the case in the simplest fashion, so you will just feel what exactly relationship between two different variables can look like in the simple case. And that's exactly how people are trying to model certain things. And again, some examples were in the very beginning of this lecture. So basically, that's it. Um, try to um, go through notes for this lecture on unizor.com. Um, and uh, if you can come up with some interesting examples and real calculations, um, which I'm kind of reluctant to do, but maybe I will do some spreadsheet calculations, in which case I will put it in the notes for this lecture. And you will see exact numbers, how it all really looked like in some practical cases, I hope. All right, that's it for today. Thank you very much and good luck.